Uh, thank you for joining us, everyone. My name is Edward Santo. I'm the Australian Human Rights Commissioner. Um, we've just been playing um, a little excerpt from uh, Machine's work, uh, which uh, was composed by one of Australia's greatest um, experts and indeed one of the world's greatest experts on artificial intelligence, Professor Kate Crawford. Um, if you're interested um, in uh, Kate's work, she, she um, spoke at one of our previous webinars, which will um, soon be uploaded onto our YouTube channel. Um, it's a great pleasure to host this webinar on human rights and technology, focusing especially on uh, the elements of our work um, dealing with people with disability um, and accessibility of uh, new technologies. Um, I'm uh, speaking to you um, from the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay tribute to the elders past, present and emerging um, of the Gadigal people. I'm also conscious that people are dialing into this webinar from all over Australia. And so I also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that everybody else is on. Um, I, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Ben Gauntlet in a moment. But I just wanna mention a couple of other things before um, we get uh, started. Um, this session, uh, this webinar is being recorded and um, we plan to upload it onto the Human Rights Commission's YouTube channel um, at some point in the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, so particularly if you have any tech difficulties and they can't be resolved um, by um, logging out and logging back in again, uh, there, there should be an opportunity to um, listen and or view um, this webinar a little bit later as well. Um, you'll be able to ask questions over the course of the session using the Q&A function um, via Zoom. Um, so please feel free to start um, uploading questions whenever um, it's convenient to do that, um, if you wish to, um, but don't use the chat function. We, we won't be using the, the chat function today. Um, there are also various accessibility provisions that we've made um, today. Uh, we have um, two Auslan interpreters, Amber and Kat, who will be providing Auslan. Um, there will also be um, captions as well um, that is being provided by AI Media and our friends at Social Deck are making this all run smoothly. If there are any elements that are not run smoothly, that's down to me and not to them. Um, and after the event, we'll be sending out an evaluation survey as well. So without any further ado, I'd like to uh, hand over to um, my colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Ben Gortland, who is Australia's Disability Discrimination Commissioner. And uh, he will uh, introduce um, some of our fellow panelists uh, today. Um, and then I'll uh, tell you a little bit more about um, the work that we've been doing on human rights and technology um, to provide a bit more context for today's webinar. So over to you, Ben. Uh, thank you very much, Ed, and um, good disability policy benefits all Australians and in the field of technology. Uh, one of the things that we know that can be an enormous enabler of an improved quality of life, but it can also exclude and discriminate, particularly um, against people with disability. And for that reason, we need to ensure that when we design new products and that we design uh, new technology that we always remember the human rights of people with disability now and in the future. Uh, I'm delighted to be here today to be a part of what is an enormously important contribution in the field of disability rights, which is the Australian Human Rights, Human rights and Technology Report. And with me today, I have three panellists. Uh, the first panellist is um, Rosemary Keyes, who is the chairperson of the United Nations Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disability. Rosemary is a human rights lawyer in the Faculty of Law at the University of New South Wales convening international law and human rights subjects, focusing on the equality provisions of the instrument, international instruments and their translation into domestic law and policy. Rosemary won the Human Rights Medal in 2019 and has also been a designated expert for the Australian government for the delegation to the United Nations regarding the drafting of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability and facilitated the drafting of Article 24 on the right to education. Our next panellist is Mr Sean Murphy, 
is a senior digital system specialist accessibility from Telstra. Sean is part of the Telstra consumer and small business organization and is the lead of their accessibility team. He was formerly a member of the Global Leadership Council for the International Association of, for, sorry, for Accessibility Professionals. He was on the expert reference group for the Australian Human Rights Commission Future Technology Project, focusing on AI ethics, leveraging its accessibility and, dis and disability extensive knowledge. Prior to this, he was the director of the Digital Gap Initiative, one government organisation advocating for laws, standards and social strategies for accessibility and inclusion for all in the digital age. He formerly worked at Freedom Scientific on the JAWS for Windows Screen Reader and provided a submission to the Australian Council of Learned Academies paper on AI ethics impact to accessibility and disabilities. Sean is a role model for others with disability in relation to how he advocates for accessibility in all aspects of software and IT design. And finally, we have Emma Benison, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Blind Citizens Australia. This is the national representative voice for Australians who are blind or vision impaired. To find out more about Blind Citizens Australia work, you can go to www.bca.org.au. Emma is a passionate advocate for the rights of people with disability to lead full and productive lives. Emma takes the opportunity to challenge myths and misconceptions which too often hinder people with disability from reaching their full potential. Prior to joining Blind Citizens Australia, Emma spent five years as the CEO of Arts Access Australia, the pink national body for arts and disability, and she was the first person with a disability to be appointed to that role. What I didn't know, which is always a good way of introducing people, is Emma is also a singer and a songwriter whose work often focuses on her experience as a person with disability as an advocate. Emma has recently become the chair of the Attitude Foundation. And for that, we congratulate Emma and we welcome her here today. Back to you, Ed. Thanks, Ben. Um, I'm now gonna spend the next uh, five or six minutes giving a bit of background uh, about um, some of the aspects of our report. We're gonna deal with it in, in chunks. Um, and, uh, and then I'll be handing over to um, Rosemary Kaius to tell you a bit more about um, international human rights law and how um, it's relevant in this area. I will be using a couple of um, PowerPoint slides, um, but for anyone who can't see those slides, I will also be um, communicating verbally, basically talking um, about the kind of key elements on the slides. Um, so uh, the, 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 I guess when we started this project, we, we had a bit of a division <laughs> between um, the use of artificial intelligence and decision-making and, um, and, and then separately uh, looking at accessibility for people with disability. And then of course, there was the um, so-called robo-debt scandal um, where uh, artificial intelligence or, or really a not a particularly sophisticated form of artificial intelligence was used um, in uh, decision-making um, to recover debts from uh, people in the welfare system. And um, we don't need to go into all of the problems um, that, that, that became apparent um, when, when that system was, was operating in practice. Um, I guess uh, one of the key things I wanna say right at the outset is that uh, we, we set out very clearly um, our concerns about um, the use of AI in decision-making, especially in really important decision-making. And I'm very conscious um, that in the move towards the use of independent assessments in the NDIA, um, that there is a risk uh, that some of the mistakes that were made with regard to um, uh, robo-debt um, could be made again um, in this context. So I've got a slide at the, uh, up on the screen at the moment, um, which kind of pulls a, a piece from the Sydney Morning Herald, um, uh, where the judge uh, that was overseeing the, the robo-debt um, settlement um, made some very uh, critical comments uh, about um, the use of robo-debt. So what does that mean? It means that we have to learn the lessons from um, robo-debt. Um, and that in turn means we have to make sure that whenever AI is used, um, especially when it's used by government, 
it must be fair, it must be accurate, and it must be accountable. And I think some of the concerns that have been expressed um, in public about the use of an algorithm in the independent assessment process um, for the NDIS is that, um, uh, that, that, that some of those elements, fairness, accuracy, and accountability could well be compromised. Um, so so to, to put that in more concrete terms, what are some of the things that we might be worried about? Uh, well, um, if an algorithm is used to, um, to make those crucial decisions in the NDIS, um, then you have to be very, very confident on the quality of the information that is being fed into the system and make sure that that is um, accurate um, and doesn't contain uh, errors or biases. Um, and so, so that really goes to the accuracy point and the fairness point. But accountability is also crucially important. And so whenever a decision is made, um, for example, using um, in, in the independent assessment area, it must be accountable. So people must understand the reasons for their assessment and they must be able to challenge that decision if they think that the decision is uh, wrong or if it's unfair or especially if it's unlawful. Um, and so just on this, I might just um, put up another slide here, which, which shows how important accountability is whenever the government uses automation, which is you know, a, a technique associated with artificial intelligence. So we commissioned some polling last year um, by Essential uh, Research. And we, we essentially, we, we'll, <coughs> what we asked them to do was to um, find out from the community how important it was that when uh, the government uses uh, an automated decision-making process, like an algorithm to make a decision that affects us, how important those, those elements of accountability are. And the short answer is that the community said very clearly that accountability is crucial. So 87% of people um, supported being able to appeal a decision, an automated decision that affects them. 88% um, of people said that they wanted to have the reasons for an automated decision. And 85% um, said that they wanted to know uh, when decisions were automated. So want, they want to know how, the, how decisions are made. Um, and so uh, when we come to looking at that, um, that question of, of, of how to learn from um, the, the, the lessons of, of RoboDebt, I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen now. Um, a big uh, kind of piece of the puzzle is making sure um, that uh, we, we, we put in place um, mechanisms that will ensure uh, that any um, form of automation or algorithmic decision making is fair, that it's accurate and it's accountable. And so as we go on in this webinar, we're going to tease out what that means in practice, because a number of our recommendations in this Human Rights and Technology Report are about making sure that that vision is realised, that we're always fair, accurate and accountable, especially when um, government makes um, decisions. So I'm now going to hand over um, briefly to Rosemary Kayas. Um, I won't um, kind of run through Ben's, uh, you know, introduction again, because he gave an excellent introduction. Um, all I will say is this, that if uh, you want someone to uh, talk you through um, some of the, the key elements from international human rights uh, law that apply to um, the Convention on the Rights of, of People, Persons with Disability, uh, there is literally almost no one in the world who is better qualified um, than Rosemary. So it's a great honour that Rosemary has agreed to speak with us for um, about six or seven minutes. Um, over to you, Rosemary. Thanks very much, Ed, and uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're all meeting today and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I'm speaking to you from Gadigal land of the Eonora Nation. And it's great to be able to join you today. Um, it's an impressive and important report that Commissioner Santo and his team have undertaken. And I'd also like to acknowledge the important contribution of Commissioner Gauntlet to this report. 
And I really welcome the opportunity to talk to you specifically about technology and the rights of people with disability. Access to technology for people with disability on an equal basis with others is fundamental for the realisation of all human rights. The Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, or CRPD as I'll refer to it as I go on, embeds impairment as part of human dignity, which requires the recognition that impairment should not be the basis for limiting or denying human rights. We live in a time of rapid technological advancement and change, and this has the ability to either break the social isolation and exclusion that people with disability experience, or it can entrench inequality and discrimination. Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states that everyone has the right to share in scientific advancement and its benefits. This has been further elaborated in Article 15 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which requires recognition of the right of everyone to enjoy the benefits of scientific progress and its applications. Now, although the CRPD doesn't directly incorporate the language of Articles 27 and 15, of these human rights instruments. The equivalent article in CRPD is Article 30. Participation in cultural life, recreation, leisure and sport. This article does not include reference to scientific progress. And this is an anomaly in the CRPD drafting process. The final text of the CRPD is a reflection of the socio-political landscape in 2006. And the emergence of the human genome problem, which presented complex and difficult bioethical debates for people with disability. But this omission does not mean that the CRPD in some way limits the rights of people with disability to enjoy the benefits of scientific progress. The preamble of the CRPD makes clear that everyone is intent, entitled to all human rights and fundamental freedoms without discrimination of any kind. And the purpose of the CRPD is to promote, protect and ensure the full and equal enjoyment of human rights and fundamental freedoms by all persons with disabilities. The CRPD recognises the right to enjoy the benefits of scientific progress through its significant focus on technology as a facilitator of the realisation of all other CRPD rights, such as the right to live independently and be included in the community, the right to freedom of expression, and opinion and access to information, the right to employment, education and health, and of course, equality before the law. People with disability have the right to, take, to the benefits of technology. Technology is part of several cross-cutting articles of the CRPD. These cross-cutting articles inform and provide guidance on how to interpret and implement the CRPD. They are not implemented in isolation, but need to be considered when taking action to progress the rights of people with disability. The CRPD requires that technology not only be accessible and affordable, and adhere, it, it must adhere to the principles of universal design. For example, how does technology facilitate freedom of expression and opinion and access to information, which is CRPD Article 21? 
people with disability already use a range of smart devices and alternative communication devices. They rely on accessible websites and screen readers and voice recognition technology, automated captioning, screen in screen technology to provide sign language interpretation. This is the means for many people with disability to formulate, exchange and express their opinions and be able to obtain information. In turn, the use of this technology and information is instrumental in enabling people with disability to participate in public and political life and to be able to form our own organisations, which are rights contained in CRPD Article 29 and the critical role that this technology has had during the COVID pandemic period has facilitated the right to life, CRPD Article 10, and the right to health, CRPD Article 25. The legal standard of non-discrimination is an inherent element in all rights in the CRPD. It prohibits discrimination on the basis of impairment. So all technology needs to be accessible to people with disability. It's not just about assistive technology or technology to enhance the lives of people with disability. It is a requirement for all technology to be inclusive and responsive to the needs of people with disability so that everyone can enjoy the benefits of technology. In conclusion, for CRPD, technology facilitates the realisation of all human rights for people with disability. It can be the means for them to participate in education, employment. It can give them access to justice, assist with living independently in the community and allow them to participate equally in, in the public discourse. For this to be possible, it requires technology to be based on principles of universal design so that it's accessible for all. Disability inclusive research is critical to accessible technology. Research that has, an, that has equal involvement of people with disability al allows our expertise to be built into the design development and end product so that technology can be used by all and benefit everyone. Technology now plays a major role in everyday life in facilitating communication and transactions. If that technology is accessible, then people with disability can be civic and political, economic, social and cultural positions participants in all aspects of community life. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosemary. Um, that's a fantastic tour of um, some of the relevant um, parts of international human rights law. Um, as you'll be unsurprised to hear, um, we at the Human Rights Commission take those international law foundations as our starting point. Um, and uh, perhaps to sort of pick up on the second last thing um, Rosemary said, um, when um, we, and I particularly um, pay tribute to uh, Ben Gauntlet as Disability and Discrimination Commissioner, because he was the key kind of strategic voice um, in this part of our uh, project. Um, when, we, when we were looking at this, we, we really boiled all of what Rosemary was talking about down to three key principles. The first, as Rosemary set out very clearly, is that access to technology is an enabling right um, for everyone, but especially for people with disability. Uh, increasingly, as you know, the world, um, be it uh, communications, um, the world of work, um, entertainment, almost every conceivable aspect of government services and everything else, um, all of this is moving online. Um, and that technology is crucial to being able to access those things and we need to recognise that. Secondly, um, technology unlocks um, opportunities, um, be they in employment, <coughs> but me in employment, education, 
happen everywhere else. Um, and so we need to recognize that too. And then thirdly, accessible design is, is, is vitally important. Um, so principles, again, like Rosemary set out um, from universal design uh, are important because um, they ensure that people with disability um, are able to access those essential goods, services and facilities. Now that is reason enough to, um, I guess, embrace universal design or human rights by design. Um, but if people want further reasons to be excited about universal design, um, then we can also point to the fact that um, those uh, principles uh, actually tend to benefit everyone, not just people with um, disability, but everyone, because those principles tend to lead to tech powered products and services um, that are more intuitive, easier to operate for the entire community. Um, so there's, there's a sen essentially a double benefit there. I'm gonna share my screen again, just for um, a couple more slides um, that, um, that really allow me to go a bit deeper on some of the other aspects of our report um, beyond artificial intelligence. And I'll just do that for about five uh, minutes and then we'll have some discussion. Um, and um, as I'm talking, uh, just a reminder that uh, if you wanna ask um, questions of, of <coughs> any or all of us, um, you can use the Q&A function uh, to do that. We might um, group some of the questions uh, as, as we go. Um, so just uh, letting you know that I'm sharing my screen again. And I have um, up on the screen now, a summary of some of the key recommendations, which I'll walk through um, one by one, which really set out uh, our reform agenda when it comes to uh, functional accessibility. Um, so one of the key recommendations is that there should be a new standard under the Disability Discrimination Act that deals with digital communications technology. Now, I am gonna out myself as a human rights law nerd. And so I know exactly what, what I mean when I talk about that, but just for anybody else who has I guess a, a more well-rounded life than I do. I'll just quickly explain what we mean by that. Um, that, that is, the, the Disability Discrimination Act is of course our core legislation um, that prohibits discrimination and discriminatory activities um, against people with disability. And there are a number of existing, what are known as standards under that legislation, dealing with things like uh, education and transport and buildings. And, and what those standards do is that they set out a bit more detail. So that the key principle that, you know, essentially thou shalt not discriminate on the basis of disability, that's in the legislation. But, but um, as we've seen in areas like public transport, what that means in practice, if um, you're someone who's responsible for trains or buses or ferries or taxis, anything that, that people use as public transport, what that means in practice, um, can require some further consideration. And so what, um, uh, while, while those standards are, are, are not perfect, um, what they can do when they're operating well is provide further guidance um, to ensure that people are applying that specific principle. So what we are saying is we need a new standard, the Disability Discrimination Act that deals with digital communications technology. So that's um, everything from being able to pick up a tech powered device and be, be able to communicate back and forth um, with it when, when that's part of the, you know, the design of the product. Um, it's also some of the um, sort of standard uh, things that we're, we're starting to see in consumer products where um, if you're buying a, you know, a smart um, white good, it could be a fridge or a washing machine or a dryer, um, that if it is trying to communicate information to you, it should do so in an accessible way that, that, um, that people can understand um, regardless of their disability. And so um, providing that, that, that clearer guidance we think is, is really important. So that's a recommendation 24 in our report. Um, the next part of our reform agenda that I wanted to mention was about um, government as a leader when it comes to accessibility. Uh, so government often um, quite rightly sets itself up as a leader um, in, accessible, in accessibility. And that's important because 
um, people rely very heavily on government to access important um, services, employment opportunities, and, and, and many other things um, as well. But also it's important because people um, who are outside of government, the private sector, look to government uh, for, um, for, 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 I guess, models that they, they can emulate. And so we set out some practical steps that government can take to um, be better in the way in which they use <coughs> and make available accessible di digital communications technology. And so that can be through things um, like, um, you know, better procurement processes uh, and, and that sort of thing. Um, the next issue I wanted to mention was um, internet access. Um, so that's our recommendation 33. Um, we propose uh, that um, everyone in Australia be able to um, access the internet um, because uh, it's um, like we considered water and energy um, you know, some decades ago. That these things are, are just fundamental to being able to participate in the community on an equal basis. And so when we talk about um, the NBN broadband as being a nation building uh, activity, um, we say that we that there needs to be um, uh, you know rates, or concessional rates um, that ensure that there are that there is equal internet access for people with disability. And the fourth and final thing I wanted to mention at this point um, was how the uh, funding under the NDIS is made available for accessible technology. And so when we, uh, we, we, we considered this um, long and hard and our recommendation number 34 is uh, uh, trying to put wind in the sails of um, many people from the disability community, what they have been advocating for some time. And that is that um, there is a place for assistive technology that in other words, um, technology that is specifically designed for people um, with disability, but there is also a space um, an important space for supporting accessible technology um, that is built into good services and facilities. And what we're saying is um, NDIS funding should be um, more readily available for accessible technology. That, so that is, um, let's say, a, a product like a mobile phone or a smartphone um, that um, may be used by the whole community, regardless of their disability. But where, where that technology is well designed, where that product is well designed um, so that people with disability can use it, um, then that of course is a good thing. And uh, what we are saying is that the NDIS um, policies should be adjusted to make it easier um, for people to, um, to be able to obtain accessible um, technology that is baked into uh, goods, services and facilities. Um, so I'm going to um, stop uh, sharing my screen again um, now, um, and uh, we're going to move over to uh, have a discussion with some of the panel members. Um, and it's a bit of an opportunity, I guess, to start to sort of um, flesh out what we mean by those recommendations um, and to get some of the, the views from um, uh, Ben Gortlett, as well as um, Emma Benison, Sean Murphy and Rosemary Kaya. So I'm going to start um, with th this idea for a uh, new standard under the Disability Discrimination Act. And I might start by posing this question to Ben, but um, I'll then invite others to um, jump in if they have views as well. But I was wondering if you could reflect a bit about what I said before about what, what the, the place of standards are um, under the Disability Discrim Discrimination Act. And um, why if you, if you have a good standard, um, it can actually play a practical role in improving accessibility, particularly in this area of technology. Ah, oh, thanks, Ed. I think uh, when we look at appropriate law reform for people with disability, we do have to view it within the context of an entire strategy, which is the National Disability Strategy. And it's important to note up front that just because a law is contained in another piece of legislation does not mean that it may not be effective for people with disabilities. So later on today, I'm going to be talking about the Broadcasting Act, the Broadcasting Services Act, and it's very important to acknowledge that you can place a law in a whole bunch of different locations, but it can have 
an effect which is ultimately very good for people with disability. A digital communication technology standard, which if you look at the terms of the paper would cover ICT, for example, desktop laptops and mobile devices, websites, and public facing communication platforms has a role because it can guide conduct in a way that can ensure that the needs of people with disability are looked after now and in the future. Now, in terms of guiding conduct, what it can do is prescribe minimum standards of what is needed. And to give people an understanding of how a disability standard works, if you comply with the disability standard, you then cannot be found to have undertaken direct or indirect discrimination under the Act. It can also create defences for certain types of um, conduct, which may be, uh, for example, unjustifiable hardship, et cetera, under the Act, which is again important because we need to make sure we have a balance. Now, I think when we look at developing a standard and, and what's necessary, we need to have a situation where industry works with people with disability in an informed manner to develop a standard which balance not only the rights of people with disability, but the need to have high quality technology now and in the future. And there will be a number of trade-offs that will have to occur over time. But ultimately, what we are aiming for is that there is, that there is a right to technology for people with disability now and in the future. And the utility of a standard is it guides conduct and that guidance of conduct can be enormously enabling and something that should occur. The issue is, in a sense, now to get the detail right as to what is in the standard and what may be elsewhere in Australian law. Thanks, Ben. Um, Emma, Sean or Rosemary, I know you've got um, all experience professionally with the operation of um, standards. Do you have any um, observations you'd like to make at this point? Um, Go ahead, Emma. Yeah, it's Emma. Um, I, I think um, I just want to echo what Ben's saying, but also from a very practical standpoint, I think any standard which um, highlights, um, you know, the, the need for accessible technology, even having a standard, um, you know, is a, is a huge step forward in and of itself. But also, I think for people with disability, um, specifically, um, any standard which, um, you know, makes it easier for us, I mean, the, the process of, um, and this is not, not in any way meaning to be disrespectful to the Commission, but the process of, of going through the, um, the process of lodging discrimination complaints is difficult enough as it is, and any standard that um, provides, um, you know, guidance and provides um, some certainty around, you know, what, um, what provisions there are and what is and isn't acceptable behaviour um, by providers of, of products and services is only going to be useful. But I think the other thing is it also just acts as an opportunity to, to actually highlight um, the fact that people with disability do use technology. I speak to technology providers a lot and I'm very shocked by how many of them just, it, it's not that they don't want to provide accessibility, it's that they just haven't thought about it before. Um, and, you know, it, it's gobsmacking to me how many um, providers just haven't considered this. So I think just having the standard and just making it explicit, um, you know, is, is only going to be um, of assistance to all of us in this space. I think that's a really good observation. Um, Emma. Um, maybe I'll pick up on one last thing and invite Rosemary or Sean if you want to join in. Um, I say this as a lawyer myself um, and prior to coming to the Commission I've worked on a number of uh, cases involving the standards under the Disability Discrimination Act. Um, the, the idea with those standards is wherever possible not to have them go to court. In other words if they're clear enough what they should do is, um, I guess, address the problem before it arises, or at least before it becomes so huge that it needs to go to court. And In so, can, yeah, exactly. So, so um, you know that that's that's why this the, this sort of reform needs to be 
needs to be really good. Um, but Rosemary, um, I'll, I'll stop rabbiting on. Did you want to jump in at that point? Well, well therein lies your problem. Uh, they're a negotiated standard. Um, they're not developed um, in the sense of, say, an ISI or an Australian standard is developed. And, um, I mean, it's always been my struggle with the DDA standards is that they are a negotiated process and what ends up in that negotiation process is rights get whittled away in, in some aspects. Um, we saw this with the transport standard, um, you know, a 30-year time frame got, was the outcome. And so it was sort of problematic from the beginning in the sense that, sorry, I've got planes going over. I'm aware that it's quite noisy. Um, yeah, so, I mean, the standards have, I think, at best, um, a highlighting role, as Emma, Emma suggested. Um, my, my first wish would be for it to be within the Australian standards and within the ISO to ensure that they covered the level of accessibility that's required because they're going to be the go-to for the technical people. That's, that's what they're used to dealing with. It's a bit like the, the strongest bits of the access to premises standards are those that are included in the building code because you know, that's what builders go to. That's what they, that's what they have to meet. And so you're going to get more traction in those spaces. If, um, if the development of standards can mirror what's within the ISO and what's within the Australian standard, well, what that does do then is gives um, an overlay that ensures there is um, the basis for a defence argument with a DDA claim. So it does um, give something in terms of the operation of the DDA, but um, whether it actually gives anything more in terms of clarity um, for the provisions within the DDA, I'm not too certain, mainly because of the way that they're developed. Yeah, no, I think that's a very, very important point, Rosemary. And I think the, one of the points you're alluding to there is about, um, I guess, the, the link between Australian standards and Wayne Hawkins asked a similar question about whether um, some of those other standards, um, uh, like dealing with procurement um, for accessible ICT, um, whether they'll be linked in with this. But Sean, did you have any um, yeah. observations about this? I was, you know, the, all the points being raised are very um, insightful. The thing is, technology can't, or any company, any body is developing any service or technology or products have to think accessibility is a form of innovation. So the law is one, one pillar that we have to consider, and it is important to consider. And there is certain things that over in the US and the, um, the ADA that they do, there's some protection for, for people with disabilities when they make a claim. And it's not necessarily written in law, but there is precedence over there. But the, the big thing is, is innovation. There is certain ISO standards, uh, like the WACAG does have, it has, it's under an ISO standard, and there is a procurement which uh, a couple of people have raised, and that is a benchmark, but but it's, it's a baseline. It's not the end of the story. So, you know, it is important when um, when, when the people are looking at the whole issue of accessibility and in, even DDA, it's they should be taken as an opportunity of how can we innovate, how can we improve things, how can we reach a wider customer base? Um, thank you, Sean. Um, we might move to um, another one of the recommendations that I referred to, um, which has also uh, come up um, in a couple of the questions, and that's regarding um, internet um, access under the NBN. And so we, we call for a concessional broad rate, band rate to, to promote more equal access. Um, I wonder if anyone has any um, observations, particularly from the last couple of years, 
uh, as um, you know, bushfires and pandemic um, have have kind of really um, sped up some of the movement online, um, and and whether that that should be factored in in any particular way. Um, did anyone want to jump in on that? Yeah, I'll cool. jump in. Uh, particularly from Telstra, uh, I'll highlight your background there. <laughs> Actually, I wasn't going to come from a Telstra point of view, but it is a challenge for all telcos. Um, but where I'm coming from is ensuring the communication for any disaster is accessible to all. There, I have heard and a little that people in certain disability demographics cannot access the information in ex equally as everyone else. So how that information is trade is it via the NBN, is it via the uh, mobile services that uh, Telco provided, is it appropriately done by the mobile devices that people use or whatever technology they have to rely on, is that information getting to in the same equivalent method as everyone else? And that's, I think, is one of the keys in relation to some of the things that you've, you've touched upon in like the, all the disasters and all the things that we have um, occurred in the last two years, which has been quite an interesting period of time to be living in. Um, you know, are people with disabilities getting that information at the same time as everyone else? Yeah. Go ahead, Emma. I, I, I totally agree with, with Sean. We, we actually um, also had a, a forum on this topic um, recently around um, communication accessibility, communication technology accessibility, and, you know, even um, things like, um, you know, how services, internet services are being provided and, you know, people, people who are blind or vision impaired being asked to look at lights on their modem so that they can help to diagnose issues. I mean, all of those, all of those challenges need to be um, dealt with if we're, if we're going to have a truly accessible um, internet um, system. But having said that, I absolutely, um, you know, support the, the, um, the critical uh, need for internet services. I mean, um, you know, blindness, for example, is is very much an ageing um, disability, and you know, Blind Citizens Australia and, and other blindness organisations still um, spend inordinate amounts of time and and energy on producing information in a whole range of accessible formats to make sure that nobody misses out. But the rest of the world doesn't do that, and the reality is that um, you know, as time goes by and the world becomes more and more internet reliant, um, it is going to become necessary for people to be able to access um, the internet and, and we don't want anyone to be left behind. And even in, in terms of um, broadcast services, which we're going to talk more about later, you know, if, if people, for example, in regional communities don't have access to the internet, well, that then, you know, limits their access to television, audio description, captioning, all of those things. So there's a massive flow on effect. So I think it is hugely important um, that, that we get this right. Yep. Thanks, um, Emma. Just before we switch gears, I just want to quickly pick up a question um, that, uh, that that really arises from our, um, our recommendation 34, uh, which is essentially saying that um, the NB NDIS um, should kind of improve access to accessible goods, services and facilities that use digital communications technology. There's a question also about that. Um, from um, our Q and A, um, saying, "Well, you know, what about people who don't qualify for NDIS?" Um, so, so in a sense, there are two aspects of that you could take a swing at. Does anyone want to um, jump in on on that issue? So, sorry, if people don't qualify for the NDIS, but they but want to, but they still need accessible technology. So perhaps um, you, you made the observation, Emma, that that sometimes older people um, may not. Uh, well, you know, increasingly um, have the same needs um, as some of the same needs as people with disability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, absolutely, of course they do, and this is one of the one of the challenges with um, with you know the eligibility for the NDIS. I mean, for example, people aged over sixty five um, are automatically ineligible for the NDIS, and not all people aged over sixty five. Um, fit into the um, the my aged care space either, um, but then there are also many other people with disability, um, you know, aged under sixty five who for for various reasons aren't eligible. So you know the NDIS, as I as I say often, it's not a panacea. It it 
it's not as if we can say, oh, we've got an NDIS, now we can all relax, as we've very much seen in the last few months with some of the, the reforms that are happening. Um, but even beyond that, you know, there needs to be a broader approach to accessible um, technology. And, you know, we need to be working with providers more closely, I think, to be looking at, you know, how, how can we make sure that um, everybody, irrespective of what scheme they might belong to, um, can access, you know, whether it be an, um, an iPhone that's got inbuilt accessibility or, you know, whatever else it might be. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's a mistake to limit ourselves just to talking about the NDIS um, when we're talking about accessible technology, for sure. I mean, Emma, Emma hits on a really important point in the fact that it's not um, labels such as disability or older persons that need to be the trigger. The actual trigger is the impairment. And if the accessibility requirement you know, devolves from the impairment, then you know, that recognition needs to be there. Um, the, I noticed in the, I think it was the paper this morning, there's, uh, there's questions being raised about older people with onset of disability missing out on the NDIS. Um, so you know, it, it, it's an issue that's on the table, but we all forget to drop the labels and get back to what the actual trigger is. And that trigger is the impairment. So if the, the National Disability Insurance Scheme is truly about supporting and funding participation for people with impairments, because that's what's behind disability, then um, it should be all people with impairments. And so maybe, maybe the uh, mutual experiences from the last two Royal Commissions might suggest that there's a commonality there somehow. But um, just getting back to the previous point about um, a concessional rate for the NBN, I'd say it's critical, but the problem with that is also whether you've got the bandwidth to be able to do all the accessible, accessible functionalities that you require, and especially when you're talking about disaster, uh, disaster risk reduction. So if you've got people that need to use video conferencing for sign language, um, have you got the bandwidth? And that's where Australian broadband um, falls down. Yes, we've got the potential, but nobody's got the bandwidth to do anything with it. Yeah, a very good practical point that really brings it home. Um, we're gonna spend the next uh, six or seven minutes uh, switching gears a bit, and I'm gonna have a bit of a chat with Sean um, before uh, handing over to Emma to talk about broadcasting and audio visual services. Um, so, Sean, I'm, I'm conscious that um, many of the participants in this webinar and many of the people who signed up um, to, to join in uh, know an enormous amount already about um, the experience of people with disability with technology, and of course, many have lived experience. Um, but others are coming into this a bit, a bit cold. So I wonder if you can um, just tell us a little bit about what it means in practice when a technology-powered product or service is inaccessible for someone who has a disability. So where I'm coming from, the people living with disabilities are going to probably um, hear what I'm going to say pretty loudly. And I'm going to use myself as a case study here because um, it's, it's a safe space and I can share some experiences that I've come across in the last 12 months um, about technology that you think would be accessible is not. So let's use the first example. And before I go into the examples, it, there is a big hidden impact here that I want to touch upon, which most people don't discuss. So the first one is I'm renovating a new kitchen, which is exciting stuff. And so we're going out with my wife, going looking for things, and I find this gig I'm looking for an electric stove. Now you think it's a basic home appliance, been around for decades. And when I go into the stores, there's one electric stove I can't use, another one I can't use, another one I can't use, because they're all touch base. What other disability groups that does that impact? Because if you think about it, it's on flat on the surface, and, and if the, the kitchen's not correctly designed for certain groups of disabilities, 
then they might not be able to use that technology. If they've got certain tremors in their hand, they might not be able to use that technology. Then now let's look, look about another technology for the current situation about the cupboard. Now, we've got an app that we use to track where we're going and you go into restaurants. It's pretty sound to look simple, you know, pretty easy design. You've got a QR code, you've got an app, you've got a phone. Now, you're someone who relies on a screen reader like myself. You go into a, a restaurant, it's noisy. First, you have to try and hear the app. Now, the app has some challenges in it, but you know, I wouldn't say it's fully accessible, but, you know, yeah, I can use it. Then you're trying to find the QR code. So I'm in the restaurant, and I'm going to overemphasize this, obviously, but I'm waving my phone trying to find the QR code, or the person who is at the restaurant is going to have to help me to find the QR code and try and line it up so I can take it. So consequently, that experience is really re removing some of my independence. And that's where I'm, and the, the, also when I go for a new job or people with disabilities go to the job, in the back of their mind, they're going to ask themselves, can I use that technology in that organization? And that is the question I ask them every time I change a job. What barriers, what new challenges are going to have? If you're continually getting those type of issues over and over, year after year, it builds up. It becomes a, what I call the um, mental bank, uh, well, well, mental well-being bank. It just builds up over time. So your confidence can be eroded. Your frustration, it's lower because, you know, once you find another thing, oh, here we go again. Your independence is eroded, your self-worth, and also what, and it's just impacting people's well-being. And this isn't really discussed heavily in the community. And, it, you know, it's, it needs to be discussed. And it's not that difficult to make technology accessible. Well, let me pick up on that because I can feel my own blood pressure rising as you are talking. <laughs> I don't have any experience it myself. It's just so yeah. frustrating. Um, so so yep. the flip side of that is what um, can and should be done to make um, tech powered products and services more accessible. What, what, what would be you know right at the top of your priority list? Well, I'm going to use Telstra as an example because part of Telstra, which I didn't mention in the panel, there is a certain regulation that we have to adhere to to ensure our products are accessible, which is called the Telecommunication Consumer Protection Code. Now, we've taken this quite seriously. We've built up a, a specialist team within Telstra who are all subject matters to accessibility. We're using the latest version of the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And when we release products, we have controls and mechanisms present to ensure we're doing the best we can, and obviously we are on a journey to improve our technology and products to make sure they're accessible. The other thing we've just started very recently is testing with people with disabilities. And that gives us the real, so, so the standards, as mentioned previously, are just the baseline. But getting the people who live with disabilities involved in developing our products and getting that information from them gives a real more rich insights on their challenges and their, and their problems. And thus we can say, okay, is this approach right? So, hence, we're talking about a life cycle of a product. So, you know, going through all the different steps that it requires to ensure that, you know, you're including all those people because it successfully starts at the beginning. It starts at the concept stage all the way to the release cycle. Now, the other area that is important is, which is stated in the paper already, uh, where we need a international recognized standard for accessibility, a certification. Now, there is a lack of skill in Australia for uh, accessibility because we find it very difficult to get those quality people because we want to you know, uh, get more people involved in this area within Telstra. And I know there are other companies out there also want to do this. Uh, so, if, you know, so that's where I see universities and other training organizations stepping up. Now, in the US, they do this already, but I want Australia to do a slightly different approach. Rather than having a subject on accessibility, build it in to the courseware. So people do not realize they're doing accessibility because accessibility is just part of your way of working. It shouldn't be anything separate. It should not be an enhancement. It should be just the way you do it. So if you go and build a website, you go and build a kiosk, you go and build an electric car, you're thinking of everyone. It's a holistic approach. That's, I think that's such a great way of describing it. I'm going to try and squeeze in one last question a bit yep. um, without notice, Sean. Um, so I talked um, at the start about uh, Algorithm, using algorithms for independent assessments. Um, and it's uh, kind of an issue that has come up in some of the questions um, in the Q&A as well. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any views about um, uh, how 
um, how to ensure that algorithms, um, when they are used in these really important areas, are used fairly accurate and accountably. The problem is, I did some research, funny enough, on a specific area, um, just for curiosity's sake. Yes, I am a geek. Um, <laughs> and <a> company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a technology geek. Um, but the thing is, there, there, there's a, a, a conference that IBM did a while ago, and they said a lot of the data sets out there for that people use, like voice, uh, 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 facial recognition, uh, and and whatever it is, do not include people with disabilities. So it really is an area of challenge because if you have a um, artificial eyes or facial deformity, and you go and try and use a passport technology or some facial technology, that it might not work because they have included data set. The other thing is, if you're including a data set from PWD and you're not considering the right thing, are you including bias data? And that has happened, and it's and we've discussed that in our um, conferences and been all the discussion papers, where and it has happened previously in the legal world, where in the US, you know, the, the situations where people used prior data and they didn't look at that data and make sure it did not include biasing, and that yeah. is the, one of the areas I see. Um, another extra area is that people use are using artificial intelligence to help and cure disabilities. But on the flip side, they're using technology for thinking that they're helping disabilities, like in the neural, diver neural diverse area, uh, where they're using robots to try and help that group of people to be more social accepted. Should we be doing that? Is that right? And my view is not necessarily. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Um, I wish we could talk more about this. We uh, I know. A little bit of time at the end. Um, but I'm now going to hand over to... Uh, Emma, um, because <laughs> one of the really important issues that we looked at was about um, a series of recommendations to make broadcasting and audio visual services more accessible. Um, so uh, over the next um, five or six minutes, uh, Emma is going to walk through some of the key themes there. Uh, and then uh, Ben will come back and talk about some of the, the key recommendations we've got in that space. So over to you, Emma. Thanks, Ed. <clears throat> um, so I want to talk, I guess, from a very practical point of view about um, the impact of audio description um, on the lives of people who are blind or vision impaired. And I guess the reason I want to do that um, is because partly because Ben's going to talk more about the, um, the recommendations in detail and look at the Broadcast Services Act, um, but also because I think it's really important for people to understand why um, you know, access, accessibility features like audio description and captioning are important. Um, and I'm mindful though of the fact that some of you um, may not be aware of what audio description is. So I just wanna briefly touch on that um, and then talk about briefly about some of the differences between audio description and captioning and perhaps why um, that's made advocacy for audio description um, quite challenging. Um, and then just talk about where we are now. So um, audio description is an accessibility feature that describes the visual elements of um, television, movies, um, and live performance as well that um, most people would take for granted. So things like settings, backgrounds, costumes, scenes, um, actions, those sorts of things. It can be turned on and off as needed. And um, it is currently um, available for at least 14 hours a week on both the ABC um, and SBS, as well as by some streaming services such as um, Netflix and Stan. And I think importantly, something that people often don't realise is that um, research has demonstrated that it's also helpful not only to people who are blind or vision impaired, but also to people with autism because it names emotions um, in a way that um, enables people to understand um, what emotions characters are experiencing. But it's also really um, beneficial to people who might be um, parents who are looking after young children and can then listen to the TV, not have to be glued to the screen. They can walk away um, while, you know, doing housework or parenting or 
whatever it is. And um, the user reflections so far, the user feedback so far about audio description um, on the ABC and SBS has been um, incredibly positive. Um, we have been inviting people to contribute their um, feedback through um, short videos um, and their feedback has been really positive. Um, people have talked about the benefit being that they can watch TV on their own. They don't have to have a family member or friend um, available to describe um, the, uh, the the show to them, um, also that they can watch more Australian content, um, which many people feel like they've missed out on, um, and that um, you know they can um, they can access um, programs that where um, they're subtitled, so where the uh, the language of the program is not necessarily English. Um, unfortunately, of course, we still don't have um, audio description on. Um, the free-to-air networks and that means that um, programs like Neighbours, for example, that are actually audio described for the UK market, uh, we don't have access to here in Australia and of course that's one of the elements that these recommendations address is um, the need for the commercial networks to get on board um, and provide audio description in the same way that the public broadcasters currently are. Um, and I think, um, you know, the, the the other important point to make, um, I just wanted to share a personal perspective, is that people often think that audio description, you know, it's just something nice to have. Um, it's a lovely sort of thing that people can can enjoy. Um, it helps them watch television. You know, it's, it's very nice. Um, but it also has another element of, you know, education. I personally have really benefited from audio description as a parent. I have two children and when they were younger, um, you know, I remember watching programs with them and regularly having to ask my four-year-old son, you know, oh, um, is that a dog? And he'd go, no, it's an owl or it's a duck or whatever. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's incredibly important in order to be able to teach children and have those really important conversations or for young children who are blind or vision impaired to be able to, um, to know what's, what's actually going on on the screen. And the other area where um, I personally have found it really useful um, is that as an artist, actually being able to um, understand how musical theatre works, how ballet works, um, both through television and live performance, I have gained a huge insight into both of those things. So, um, you know, I think um, there's no doubt that this is a really important element. Um, and I guess one of the reasons why I think um, we, we have advocated, and when I say we, I mean the whole um, of the um, blindness sector has advocated for well over 25 years um, to get to the point that we are now. And I think one of the reasons why we struggled is because audio description is unlike captioning. It's not visible. You can't see it. And so unless you know how to turn it on or off, um, then it's really, um, yeah, it's it's hidden. So people are not aware of it. And I think that's one of the reasons why we've, um, we've struggled. Um, and I think um, the, the other, the elements uh, where the ABC and SBS, I think have done an excellent job um, thus far is in the sense that they have actually collaborated with the sector, but also directly have spoken um, in various forums and through surveys and so forth with people with disability to actually find out what we need and want um, out of the service. And they've also been really open to recognising that it's not just about having the audio description available. It's about informing people about it. So they've actually worked with us, um, for example, with Blind Citizens Australia to get information about audio description on our telephone system. They've worked with Vision Australia to get audio description information out to people um, in various formats as well. And so I think that demonstrates a real um, willingness to understand the information needs of the sector. An area where I think that's not um, unfortunately going so well is um, on some of the streaming services. Some of them are um, doing an excellent job, uh, but some of them, unfortunately, while they have audio described content on their platforms, the actual inaccessibility of the, of the platform itself uh, makes those platforms really challenging to access. Um, yeah. But in, in general terms, I would say, um, you know, the, the 
the implementation is going pretty well and I really hope that it continues um, to develop and grow over time. Um, thank you so much, Emma. That's a fantastic kind of pricey of your landscape, um, uh, including, you know, giving us a sort of, you know, bits to laugh and cry and kind of the ironies where where you have something that um like on some of the streaming platforms as you say where there is some good audio description but you can't quite get there <laughs> um and that's uh that's something that, that that we really want to address um so uh, i'm going to hand over now to ben um who's going to talk uh, for the next five or six minutes on some of the key recommendations that we have in the report um that are designed to pick up on some of those issues over you ben uh, thanks very much, Ed, and um, it was really great to hear from Emma and Sean and get their perspective on the importance of uh, accessible technology. Um, what we know about people with disability in the community is that they are diverse, but also that disability itself is diverse. And to deal with this, the convention seeks to embrace a model of substantive equality called inclusive equality. That seeks to address structural discrimination in addition to direct and indirect discrimination. It further provides for a framework for a positive response to human diversity in order to achieve equality, taking into account power relations and different layers of identity. The principles of equality and non-discrimination entail stopping all forms of discrimination against persons with disabilities, including discrimination by private actors. But Perhaps critically, also ensuring that legal and policy frameworks enable persons with disabilities to fully participate on an equal basis, basis to others. It is important that, we, that when we consider human rights and technology, to be aware that not all disability is visible and disability may be episodic too. 4.4 million Australians presently live with disability and 80% of disability is acquired during the totality of an individual's life. 2.65 million Australians have caring roles. My role today is to focus upon Chapter 13 of the Human Rights and Technology Report, which deals with broadcasting and audiovisual services. It's a, it's a little bit of a dry read compared to some other aspects of the report because it deals with legislation and need to amend legislation, but it is undeniably incredibly important. Um, the recommendations which are set out is to address the problem of what's termed in the report functional accessibility, which is the need to be able to use good services and facilities that use particular technology. This is done by increasing audio description and captioning requirements for broadcasting services, as well as video, film and online platform, improving the provision of accessible information during emergency and important public announcements, and better monitoring of compliance with accessibility requirements and voluntary targets for the distribution of audiovisual content. Uh, Rosemary Kay, Chair of the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, eloquently articulated the articles that are picked up by the issue of human rights and technology for people with disability, and in particular, the importance of Article 9 dealing with accessibility. And I would refer you all to general comment number two, which deals with this issue. In looking at the report though, it is important to perhaps traverse some of the recommendations that were made. Recommendation 27 is that the Australian government should amend the Broadcasting Services Act to increase the amount of accessible content available for people with disability who have hearing or vision issues and to make sure that there is accessible content available for, pe for people on national and free to air services and to increase the captioning of their content on an annual basis. It should be noted, although there is some audio description available on the ABC and SBS at an average of 14 hours per week, Australia is the only English-speaking OECD country without compulsory minimum quotas for audio description on free-to-air television. Free-to-air broadcast services are the most popular medium for older people who make up almost three-quarters of of people who are blind or vision impaired in Australia. That proportion is predicted to increase with ageing and the age-related nature of vision and loss. And I refer you to Emma's comments in relation to the benefits of audio description and, capture and um, other forms of technology for people who have 
uh, are vision impaired. Um, in terms of recommendation 28, the Australian Government Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Communication should conduct a review of, to identify effective practical ways to increase audio description and captioning on secondary or specialist broadcast channels. The reason for this is it is noted that there should be a pathway towards captioning and audio description on all forms of available technology or media for people with disability. And this is also picked up by recommendation 29. And one of the most pleasing aspects of the report I felt was that it understood the, the changing nature of media and technology and the use of media for people with disability and it extended to video on demand, social media and other services that are not presently covered by the Broadcasting Services Act. The report dealt with the Broadcasting Services Act and the availability of captioning, audio description, and importantly, the issue of Auslan and the availability of Auslan during um, media. But there are also two other issues in Chapter 13 which are worth highlighting. One of those is the provision of communication in relation to emergencies. And what recommendation 30 of the report dealt with was the provision of Auslan interpreters and other accessible forms of communication when emergency announcements needed to be made. Although it's easy to focus upon COVID-19 when we look at emergencies, it is also important to acknowledge that the bushfires were a significant issue for people with disability and other forms of natural disasters can have significant issues for people with disability. So it is vital when we have public announcements to ensure that the Auslan interpreter is visible on the screen at all times. And the Broadcasting Services Act should be amended to reflect this. Um, this also deals with an important issue under Article 11 of the CRPD relating to disaster management and how we manage issues of risk for people with disability in humanitarian emergencies and natural disasters. And the final recommendation which was made was that recommendation 31, which dealt with the Australian Communications and Media Authority, consulting with broadcasters and introducing monitoring and compliance measures to support them to comply with accessible services requirements, provide quality accessible services, and increase organisational capacity to comply with current and future accessible service obligations. And I think in relation to that issue, that probably brings up a broader issue for disability policy more generally, which is the importance of collecting data and looking at the practical effect of laws that exist for people with disability. In a sense, it's not enough that we have a law relating to technology, it's that the law is effective. It's that the policy creates meaningful social change. And two of the policies which interrelate with this going forward will obviously be the National Disability Strategy, which is being revised this year and is to reflect our obligations under the CRPD, but also the potential for the development of a National Disability Data Asset, which could collect data in relation to some of the issues outlined in Chapter 13 to ensure that we have meaningful compliance now and in the future. Back to you, Ed. Thank you very much, Ben. Um... We're absolutely racing along and we've only got 10 more minutes before the end of the webinar. So I'm just gonna ask um, one or two uh, last questions and then I'm gonna invite uh, Emma, Sean, Rosemary, and then to give um, any last reflections that they wanna give. Um, so Emma, uh, you're a kind of a leader in civil society, um, particularly in the disability area. Um, what, what do you think um, civil society uh, organisations should be doing to advance some of the, the recommendations that we've set out in our report. Uh, you've just got, actually got to oh, mute. I there, just want to mute. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, look, I th I think um, that the most critical thing that civil society organisations can do, and it might sound like it has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with technology, um, but is to make sure that people with disability are employed. Um, in their organisations, um, particularly at senior management level, because um, if we are serious about advocating for improved access to technology, and if we are serious about our concerns about um, AI and how it might be used 
either to uh, our greater good or to our detriment, um, then I think, you know, we, we need, there need to be more of us um, actually speaking on our own behalf um, and actually um, having agency of, of some of these issues. And I think, um, you know, while we have sp people speaking for us, you know, and, and many of whom are incredibly well-meaning allies and, and do an amazing job, I'm not diminishing what, what people do. Um, however, you know, if we're really wanting to see that attitudinal shift towards um, you know, as, as Sean said, access just being inbuilt um, rather than an afterthought. We have to start with our own organisations and the way that we do that is to keep people with disability at the centre of those organisations. So sorry, Ed, for hijacking the agenda onto employment, no. but I just really think it's very important. I don't think that's hijacking at all. I think that's a very, very important principle and I think one that we the Human Rights Commission think about a lot. Um, we don't always get it 100% right um, and if I can describe myself as an ally, I don't always get it 100% right, but it's something that we always need to be really front and centre in our minds um, striving for. Um, so thank you for that. I'm now going to invite um, each of the four um, people who joined me to, to give some reflections. And I might start with um, United Nations expert, Rosemary Chaos, um, to, to kick us off there. Rosemary, would you like to give some final reflections? I'm going to be brutal. I'm going to try and keep you all to a minute. <laughs> uh, you might be on mute there, Rosemary. Not a nation's expert, I may be, but unmuting is beyond that. Uh, <laughs> You're Sean... operating at a higher plane, Rosemary. <laughs> oh, please. Give it a rest. Um, I just want to say ditto to Sean. I think Sean hit on one of the critical points of the day, and that is that the concept of impairment, or more, more, cons more concisely, the, um, the continuum of the human condition, the understanding that you know, impairment is just one aspect of the human condition, should be built into our education system from the word go. So when universities are researching and they come up with something that becomes a new end product, that impairment is built into it from the get go. That inclusive research practices drive research, it drives algorithms, formulation, it drives the conceptual framework that researchers and tech heads work in and that it's not something that we have to try and beat into people after the fact. So, yeah, I just think Sean's point earlier was spot on and I think it's where we need to get to if we really want to see inclusive communities. Thank you, Rosemary. And as soon as you said tech head, I also thought of Sean. So maybe that's a perfect segue over to you, Sean. AI has a lot of benefits to society and also has some um, negatives. It's the way we use that technology is how we can benefit society as a whole. Um, accessibility is about all. It's not about necessarily disability. Yes, that is a category, but accessibility, as, as you mentioned earlier, Ed, it does benefit all. Uh, there is some really exciting stuff occurring in the AI sector, which I, you know, I, I think I'd like to share because I've gave some negative sides before, and let's give some, and I think it's positive, roll up on a, uh, on a positive. So there's technology out there used for AI where if you have language problems or, or, or communication challenges, it will change words into graphical symbols to help you out. There's AI that does object recognition. So for, Ford did a... Um, prototype where someone in a car could read the window and it came up in braille. Now, how practical it is, that's a different story, but the concept and the, the playing and the research in that area, it's really exciting stuff. So innovation is really where I see people need, should treat accessibility as a way of making your products usable by all. Fantastic. Um, Emma, one minute reflections before we pass on to Ben. Uh, oh, hang on. Uh, sorry, you 
Oh, yeah, I'm having no, trouble too, fine. Rosemary. It's not just you. Um, yeah, look, I'd, I just want to um, pick up on a couple of things that have already been said. I think um, the point about the mental fatigue that comes with constantly having to navigate inaccessible technology is something that we don't talk about enough and we do need to talk about it more and we need to um, not be not be afraid to um, let people know that this is actually a real issue um, that plagues us, um, that it's not just about... Um, you know, it being a little bit annoying, it's a cumulative, there's a cumulative effect of inaccessibility that um, uh, that piles on us over time. Um, and that's why we get so excited when we do find a really accessible product and, and why we want to shout it from the rooftops. And so I guess what I wanted to say, uh, again, picking up on Sean's positivity theme, is that um, there's so much there's so much um, great kudos for organisations that take the time to make their products really accessible and do the right thing and consult effectively with people with disability from a broad range of demographics and backgrounds. And, you know, there are some fantastic examples of, um, of where that's occurred, you know, um, whether it be through, through um, you know, um, pieces of technology that we use every day, like the iPhone to adaptive technology. So, you know, I think if people are prepared to go on that journey with us and companies are prepared to go on that journey with us, then we will get to that point, that utopia that Sean's looking for, where accessibility is just part of everything we do. And that's and that's the way that it should be. So, you know, let's all, all work towards that end point, I think. Terrific. Thank you, Emma. Um, ben, would you like to join us in Utopia for a minute, at least? Uh, thanks, Ed. Uh, and thanks to all my fellow panellists. One of the best things about doing these panels is to learn from other people with disability, uh, both from their experiences and their knowledge. Uh, in the UK, they estimated that the spending power of people with disability is 274 billion pounds per year. And one of the most important aspects of technology in terms of it as an enabling right for people with disability is also that it is good business and good social policy. When we create products and services that are accessible to each and every person with disability, they are often more intuitive and they are often better. When we think about the development of technology through the years, one example which affects me is the use of voice activated technology, which I use. And that has changed from being moderately accurate to now being very, very accurate. It could be used on all manner of smartphones going forward. It is, in a sense, gone from being bespoke to the standard. We need to ensure that we educate the community as to the importance of human rights and the importance of a meaningful understanding of accessibility, which includes working with people with disability to create products and researching those products going forward. Um, this report and sessions such as this are incredibly important to ensuring that that narrative is an appropriate one where we understand the importance of working with people with disability and not for people with disability to develop products and services which can benefit generations. Thank you. That's a perfect way to wrap up. And in the last sort of 30 seconds, all I would do is thank very deeply um, Ben Gauntlet, uh, as well as uh, Rosemary Caius, um, Emma Benison and, and Sean Murphy for their excellent contributions. Um, hopefully, uh, people will be interested in delving a bit more deeply into our report. Um, you can access the report itself at tech.humanrights.gov.au. We've also put some summary material in there if a 200 page report um, doesn't quite float your boat, um, which would be understandable because people are busy. Um, and uh, there are other ways in, in which you can engage with it. Um, there are also some upcoming uh, webinars um, beyond this one that you can also find out about on our website um, if you click events, including one that we have tomorrow um, looking at government use of artificial intelligence, which will um, certainly uh, kind of go in a bit more deeply on that issue of independent assessments under the NDIS. 
So once again, um, thank you all very much. Also thank um, our Auslan interpreters um, and our live captioning experts. And as always, our good friends at the Social Deck for helping us put together this important webinar. Thank you again.